All right, so like, happy Friday. We're going to start uh, with some PTA business, just some brand business here from our wonderful PTA president, Becky McMains. Let's give her a hand. Yes. All around here. Total amount raised, Ben, was? Ben is our treasurer. 5367 yeah. yeah. And we, we got, we had $1,000 in expenses, so that brings us pretty close to 5000 overall. So congratulations, everybody. Thank you, for your All of that money is going to field trips to make sure kids can get on buses to go to field trips. Um, number two, what was number two? Oh yes, elections are coming up. Elections go like this. We have to elect a nominating committee so elections can happen. Nominators can be suggested. So I might think that Lynn Peter would be phenomenal for the nominating committee. So I say, Peter, I'm going to nominate you. I'm going to throw you under the bus because I know you're someone who has the following qualities. Now we have documents that we're going to send out to all of our members for you to review. We don't have time this morning to do it, but be thinking about members of the community who are PTEA members and who are already involved and have shown themselves to be good characters. Um, and then we'll start discussing that later on this one. Thirdly, uh, for the PTA to have a PayPal account, we need to vote and say, yes, we love PayPal, officially we can do this. So if you're a PTA member and you approve the use of a PayPal account, please put your hand in the air. If you are a PTA member, if you signed in, Miss A, you are not. Put your hand down. No? You're not. You didn't pay your dues. We can talk about this later. Okay, well, okay. Count. Count. Can you count? Count. Count. Oh, Mr. Sparks is a PTA member. Very good. Emily, you're a PTA member. Okay. Okay, more than two thirds. If you have if you have questions or concerns about that, please go and talk to Ben afterwards. He's our treasurer. And uh, we'll come and talk to me. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you very much. T-shirts. Fiesta T-shirts. This is really what the meeting is about. Um, $10 per T-shirt. We've got forms here. You should get forms in a folder. You should get forms through Monday Mail Out. Um, $10 a T-shirt. Adult, child, there. The ones in the folder that we call the blue. The shirt's purple. Purple, orange, and this was designed by one of our parents, Coral Diaz, Alan's wife. Phenomenal, right? You will not see it. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, got this. This is the last <laughs> Okay, on Saturday the 6th, right? 9 till 11, we're having Earth Day. Come and help maintain the garden. Come and learn about recycling. Come and eat fabulous snacks. Come and have a great time with this wonderful community. That'll be our project. We're done. That's it, I'm saying no. Okay. <laughs> we're not going to copy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just as an extension of that, our student ambassadors uh, have been working on identifying a project for our campus and they really want to work on our cafeteria and on recycling. So they are tackling a couple things tied to Earth Day. Um, they are, they talk to our district supervisor of cafeteria services to learn about portion sizes and why kids get what they get, what the nutrition facts are. They were learning about the trays, they're trying to push on uh, different tray options for the cafeteria. So they're asking lots of great questions of our district. Aaron Stein, our, I'm not sure what his title is, but he works on recycling and green ideas for the district. He came and talked to our kids as well about recycling in our classrooms. So they're working on a PR campaign that will go out in our morning announcements and to our families uh, uh, around recycling the classrooms and then in the cafeteria, um, sharing table information during lunch. So look, look for that, talk to our kids about it as you see them. They have student ambassador shirts. Uh, in fourth through sixth grade that they're wearing uh, on Sunday, so kind of look to them to ask about that. Okay, uh, thank you for being here. I'm, I'm really, really grateful that you're here first. Uh, you know, one of the great things about our community is that people care a lot about our school. 
And so the idea that you care enough to be here today, and that you care enough to ask, you know, can I get the notes, and can I get the PowerPoint, and can I learn more about what we're doing, it matters to help our school, and I really appreciate it. Um, I want to introduce a couple of people, knowing that we'll spend more time later on talking to some of these individuals. Um, I want to introduce Doug Dawson up here in the front. He'll share a little bit later on. Um, Steve Leshlow is our board member. We'll be here in the back. We'll have some time to ask him some questions. I also want to introduce Sonia Mora, who's one of our uh, amazing principals in our district. Uh, works over at Gates and then Cameron, who's part of this initiative. So I'm really uh, thankful that she's here this morning. And then uh, we have Megan Adolfson, who's running our, our video here. She's wondering why I'm, I'm looking at her. But she's joining our campus next year uh, in the master's program in teaching. So she is going to be joining our classrooms as a teacher and then um, hopefully in our district as a teacher and hopefully here after that. She's exceptional. Um, so a few more people. Roxanne DeBalz will do in the back is our associate principal. If you don't know her, get to know her. Um, she's been an amazing asset to our campus this year. Um, I just want to share uh, a little bit uh, with you uh, about context for today, but before I do that, I want to hear from you. Um, so there's a sticky note on your table. There are some pens on your table as well. If you don't have those things, then we have some extra pens over here that we're going to pass out. You steal some sticky notes. All you need is one or two sticky notes. And if you can just take two minutes answering this prompt right here, what do you appreciate most about our campus? As a parent um, of a student at our campus, what do you appreciate the most? We'll just set a timer for two minutes, and then I'll let you know. I'll raise my hand whenever it's time for us to come back together, and then we'll go on to the next step. If you need pens or sticky notes, if you could raise your hand, and we'll walk them over to you. <coughs> because of Monica Sordo, and I'm totally fine with that. <laughs> How's the coffee today? Good? Are we getting better and better every time? Or? <laughs> I just want to give uh, thank you to Vince. He was the one who provided this. Please raise your hand. I know you love this. He provided the tacos today. Thank you, Mr. Table. You don't have to get up. Find somebody else at your table and share a couple things off your list that resonate most with you, and then listen to what they have on their list. So find someone else right next to you who you can share with. Thank you. 
So we're going to go around, if you're okay, just sharing a couple of thoughts with the group, uh, we would we'd appreciate it. Is there anybody from this front table that wants to share a couple of things? And I'm going to repeat it because the, the uh, mics can't pick up on what you're saying. So after you share, then I'll share it back out with the whole group. Anybody from this first table wants to share anything about what you said that you appreciated? One or two things? Yeah. He said um, access to me. Okay, access to me, and then uh, our uh, community atmosphere at the store. Okay, great. But this table right here in the middle, guys and ladies, you, you want to share one or two things? Um, the parent-teacher community. Parent-teacher community. And then also share the fact that uh, students are greeted by name. Ah! Students are greeted by name at the door. It's great. That would be me. Thank you. Ah! Sitting over here for your conversation? <laughs> Social emotional aspect being part of the curriculum. Here at this table? I think we as a whole said the caring attitude of the staff and you know, everybody, teachers, staff, everybody. Caring attitude of the staff and, and our teachers. In the back, in the in the chairs. <laughs> the diversity and proximity. Diversity of the school and then proximity. What was the second part of what you said? <laughs> Neighborhood school. That's great. Thank you. The middle table here. We have a smaller school which promotes a sense of community. Smaller school that promotes a sense of community. Teachers, you say great teachers? Yeah, great teachers. And then the table over here. Well, I think small community also, and great teachers. Small community, great teachers. Anyone who we missed who wants to share anything with the whole group? Yes, ma'am. So you appreciate that we're asking for feedback about the direction of the school. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Just one really quick story. So in the SEL curriculum, I didn't know that yellow means excited, and green means calm, and red means angry, and blue means sad. And the way I learned that is I was like rushing the family out the door one morning, and my daughter who was in pre-K was like, you're in yellow and you really need to get to green right now. <laughs> That's some good advice. <laughs> yes, ma'am, go ahead. Have, having a quality public school. Having a quality public school. Thank you all for that. 
Okay, so after hearing from you, um, we just want to give you sort of a snapshot of the journey that the school has gone through. Some of you have been here for six years. If you've been here for five or six years, can you just raise your hand? There's a number of people in the room who have been here. I, I guess I should raise my hand too. <laughs> um, if you've been here for just zero to two years, let, would you mind raising your hand? So a lot of you, right? So part of the introduction here is just to give some context for the journey that we've been on and the rationale for why that journey has taken place. First, in 2013, the district formed a partnership with Trinity. Um, that partnership was originated in part by Mr. Leshlow and our superintendent at the time and the Trinity staff to, uh, for a couple of reasons. One, the school was successful. It was close to Trinity, it was small, and there was there were sound teaching practices here at the campus that we could build from. Uh, that's when I came to the school six years ago. That's when Pat came to the school six years ago as well. In, in 2014 through 2016, we took several years to vision out the charter for the campus, and that included a lot of listening at sessions like this, where we're asking questions and getting feedback around tables and taking their responses from both families, but also teachers and community members, our district staff, and really trying to listen to figure out what are our assets in our community that we can build from, what are, what are our student needs that we need to address, and what sort of program would adequately and exceptionally support kids through their time at the school. So we spent a lot of time doing that. Um, and there, there was a year when we almost went to file our charter and we thought we didn't have enough information yet, so we went back to get more. It was important to us to make it a reflection of what people in our, in our community wanted. Um, in 2016, we became approved, it was December of 2016, the school board approved us as an in-district charter. So we had written it, we had gotten family votes, we had gotten staff votes. Um, and then the school board approved it. We then applied for funding through the state for a two-year grant that is expiring this June. That was $800,000. So that December through March time frame in 2016 to 2017, approval, funding, and then launch in the fall of 2017. The rationale for the charter in part was to um, put in place more high quality programming for our kids. We knew that there were some things that we could do better at the campus and it was a way for us to vision out what that would look like and sound like for our students and for our teachers. Am I going too fast? Can you go back again to the last one? It was so good, but I didn't capture it. Um, yes, yes, I can. I can try. Thank you. Um, effectively, we knew that we, that we needed to put better programming in front of our students and we needed to figure out how to vision out the campus. So part of the charter visioning was us saying, here's what we value. This is what we don't value. How do we build around the things we value? How do we create um, clear avenues to get to the things that will help us to reach, the, to reach those, those values in our school? And there were some things that were happening that were preventing us from reaching our goals, right? And in writing the charter, we identified a number of things, a number of structures, um, at the district level or the state level that we wanted to get waivers from. So part of our charting process was to say, we don't want to do those things anymore, or we want more flexibility here. That was through the charting process. Uh, just one sort of concrete example is, in my second year here at the school, we, were, we had a staffing issue, and we were getting cut one teacher. So the way that the district policy was built was that, that the teacher who would be cut was the newest high need teacher. Uh, she was one of our best teachers at the time. So because that structure was put in place, um, I had to then make a bunch of calls, call the superintendent, um, ask Steve for some advice over here, and really cash in a lot of equity in order to keep that teacher on the campus. So part of our waiver system that we put in place with, the dis with, with, our, with our charter was to say, we don't want that in place anymore. We want to be able, if someone gets to this place, I want autonomy to then select who it is. Because we, in the office, and I, and I think I have a good feel for which teachers are ready to take on this really challenging work. And so that leads to some really hard conversations that I have to have with teachers, but I'd much rather have that than have that decided by a bureaucratic system that doesn't meet our needs. We can't do that without the charter in place. That's why the charter was put in place, in part, to create a system where we had more flexibility. There's a lot of other examples, I'm not gonna bore you with those because there are a lot of principal talk and I don't wanna take you there. But this job's really hard and we need more flexibility, I think is the bottom line. Um, we then went through the, the, the launching of our charter. 
Um, and then in 2018, sort of fast forwarding to the to the um, summer and the begin the beginning of this school year, um, there is a replicating great options um, uh, initiative that was started at TEA, and that that's tied to the network principal initiative, where I'm sharing some time between here and then over at Bell. The idea being that what's working here, how can we scale it out towards other campuses? And how do we offer a support system at Lamar to make sure that we don't lose, lose value in programming? Um, it's been a significant learning year, certainly for me, I think for the district, and I think for our support system. Um, and we're still learning, right? We're, we're in the midst of it. Um, but I just want to give you some context for like where the anchoring for then the next piece of our conversation goes into part of that RGO partnership uh, in the network initiative was to think about we need additional funding to support programming in, in our schools. We need partners to help um, engage in thought partnership with us. Um, and there's a structure for us to actually get access to that information and those resources that, that was developed um, in part with Mr. Dawson's support at TEA. Um, so the search began late last fall to look for a nonprofit partner um, that was vision aligned with our vision of teaching and learning here at the school. Because the charter was already voted on. Many of you voted on the charter. Many of our teachers who are here now voted on the charter. So the idea being that we didn't want to bring in a partner that would then push us off from what we had already agreed to. Because many of you had already agreed to it. And our teachers had certainly already agreed to it and done a lot of work around it. So if we didn't onboard a partner who is going to have their own idea of, of what they think teaching learning should look like, then it would then feel like they were sort of trumping what we believed in. And we didn't want to go there. Um, so in looking at partners, there were a number of partners through um, late fall, winter, early spring, that were not the right fits for us. So I had to really dig in to say, we, we are not willing to waver on this, this set of beliefs. Um, I think I have a good feel for what we believe in. I want to say I do. And there was a partner that we were that, that was being pushed really, really hard, um, uh, and it wasn't the right fit for us. So I had to have a lot of really hard conversations to then get us off that partner. Um, it took us a long time to identify a partner. Um, other networks identified their partner in the fall or in December or January, and they were able to bring that partner in front of families and say, this is the partner that we have identified. How do you feel about this partner? We didn't have that opportunity because it got so late in the game. And so we had a choice to make. Do we go with a vision aligned partner who will help enhance the programming for our kids and for our teachers? And I really believe that. Or do we not go with any partner and lose the resources that would come with it and the thought partnership that would come with it, knowing that we need that here? We need that everywhere in public schools. So um, Doug is going to come on and share a little bit about context for the organization. Uh, and at the end, we'll have time for questions. Uh, but I, I really want to, just to make this point clear that um, if there was not vision alignment with a partner that we that we then move forward, um, this would not have moved forward. So if the programming was going to be changed, or if they were going to shift our belief system here at the campus, we would not have gone with that partner. Um, I, it's too much of a compromise of the work that we've done over the last five plus years to go with a partner who's going to push us off what we believe. Uh, and it would sort of be like, what's the point? What was the point in all of that work to really get clear on what we believed in if we're going to let some other organization come and then tell us what to do? That's not what this is. Um, I, I, I've had a chance to meet and talk to Doug um, and get to know him through the RGO partnership. Uh, he'll give you some context for that. Um, but um, I'm really excited for you guys to meet him. Uh, I think often the, the unknown is harder than the known sometimes, and I'm excited to get to know them today. So, welcome to our crew, Doug, and... Uh... Good morning. Good morning. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna jump ahead just for a second, because I think this is really important. Um, and so I'm gonna jump right ahead. School Innovation Collaborative mission here is um, empowering great leaders to design or launch partner networks for helping more great schools. I think there's a really critical piece here. It's the great leaders piece. Um, and I just want to thank Ryan right now. And I think like I would appreciate it if we all just gave him a round of applause. For you.
and I think everything I've seen this week has reinforced that even more so. And so I'm just, I thank you, Brian. I mean, I've, I've been more than appreciative of the way that you've supported me in this process and what you're doing on your campus. So a little bit about me. Um, you see up here, I'm from Burnham, Texas, Blue Bell Ice Cream. Um, typically, I say I'm from Houston, but for those of you in Texas that know Blue Bell, you really know Burnham. Um, the other is, uh, there's a math equation up here. I was um, a former math teacher, uh, so I started off actually a um, graduate of a and Rice uh, doing accounting. Uh, realized that um, I was not um, interested in going the accounting route, did an internship. Uh, realized I wasn't able to um, be passionate about working with kids. Uh, so I was trying to find a path to get into education. So I found uh, Teach for America, uh, which gave me kind of some great pay. Why don't you go try to be a teacher? Uh, as part of that, um, I got put in place in um, Dallas teaching seventh grade math, uh, probably the hardest thing in my life. Um, so I walked in, I was teaching an all boys seventh grade classroom and an all girls seventh grade classroom. Very little training, I was a competent accountant, but not necessarily a competent educator. Uh, so with the boys, I, I grew up with our brothers in a small country town. Like I knew how to get those boys motivated, how to build culture. Uh, I walked into the girls class and was humble my first six weeks. I walked into Thanksgiving like that first grade teacher, just like, please get me to the turkey because I need to take a break and I need to reset with this classroom these kids. The hard part was getting the data at the end of spring or at the end of Thanksgiving and saying, that six weeks cost those students time because I couldn't get the credit. And the reason I tell you this story is because it was so important to me that the value of the educators, those closest to kids that can make the impact, is what we need. We need to empower them and we need to give them flexibility. And they are supported by great school leaders that do the same thing. Um, so this is you know, six weeks of my education and I'm fully committed to this idea. Um, and I've spent my entire career since then trying to create systems that empower those closest to kids. And I want you to take anything away from today. That is the most important thing, that this is about empowering the closest to kids. <laughs> so after doing this, I actually went to the TA, um, Brian mentioned this, I'm going to keep it pretty short because I know you want to get to questions, but um, I launched a... Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm actually fairly quiet on some of the things today, so if you hear me, just kind of like yell at me, give me, give me kind of the, the hands up and I will, I will speak up. Um, so, thank you, Brian. So at the Texas Education Agency, I started a program called Replicate Great Fellowship. So in this idea of empowering those closest to kids, they allowed me to start a program that was empowering principals um, to launch their own networks, um, design learning environments that were better for students. Ultimately, around the belief that if great principals could design networks to hit multiple campuses, Brian helping multiple campuses is amazing for kids. Um, so I walked in, there were three fellows. The commissioner said, find the, the best principals across the state. Um, we want them to expand their impact. Um, we found three principals. Brian was one of them. Um, Delhi also in San Antonio, um, and then another principal out of Boston. Uh, so six months later, or a year later, um, when this opportunity came along, I already knew Brian. I knew the humble leader that he was. Um, and it's the only reason that I took this opportunity was because of that interaction with someone that I had um, a long time ago. And quite frankly, like, really proud to be a part of it. And had I not had that relationship, I don't think that vision alignment would have been right. Really So I think there's a lot of questions like, what is the role of the SIG? And then I'm also going to get like, what is not the role of the SIG? Because I think that's really important in providing clarity. I think there's been a lot of questions to this, and given how fast we've been moving, I think it's been hard to get this information out as clearly as possible. So the role of SIG is to co-create learning, uh, learning community for network principles. Um, so you have Brian, and you also have Sonia here, who has her own amazing story. Um, and so part of this organization is how do you create that professional learning community that's um, Both have amazing things about their campus, both also have things that they can learn from each other. Um, so this is going to be a great opportunity for them to create professional development opportunities that are meaningful to them. I don't know what those are. Um, they are the great leaders. Um, my job is to create the space for them to design learning opportunities that are beneficial to them that are going to help them with their students and their staff. Another problem I have is to liaison with the district staff and leadership um, to enhance autonomy or flexibility for these school leaders. Um, so a lot of you know what I've heard great leaders talk about, even Ryan talked about, is every time I need something from the central office, I have to take my time to go um, and work with the district office to get this done. And that takes time away from my campus that I could be um, spending executing the plan that we created together. Um, so a lot of my time is actually going to be bringing up this time by liaisoning with the district um, to create that additional flexibility. 
It's also going to be to support the campus teams with the implementation of the charter. So this organization is here designed in the contract to support the charter that you all have. Um, so a lot of my role is being a thought partner with Brian. How do you actually achieve the things in the contract? How do we meet the performance standards in the contract? And if we do that, we're ultimately successful. The other is highlighting the importance of empowering great leaders. Um, and I've told you know, the first day that I met with Brian and Sonia, I think one of the things that inspired me most is like we as a state and as a country need to share that we need to highlight great people like Brian and Sonia. Otherwise, the education system isn't going to attract the greatest people to serve these roles, and that's critically important. So part of my role is actually just to be humble and share their story. Things to clarify. Staff and students will always remain district students. I think this has been a big misconception. Part of my role at the agency was working with partnerships, and I think it's a common one across the state. All of the students, the staff, our partnership will remain part of the district and accountable to the school board. Um, I'm very excited to do so. School leaders are always going to manage the day-to-day -day operations of the campus, um, and they're going to manage their staff. Ultimately, we're accountable to the school board. Um, there is no scenario in which we are not accountable um, to your locally elected school board. We can also not change your charter without following due process. Um, so the same process that you all follow, um, that is the only process to change the charter. Um, we don't intend to do that. Um, and we're actually really excited about helping you implement um, the charter plan that you created. I went from being not loud enough to... Yes. Um, so the other one is, let's talk a little bit about the network. Um, so you have the Lamar Bowden network and you have the Gates Cameron network. Um, so these are two very distinct networks. It does not mean that they are going to merge together, change plans, and become the exact same um, school. What it means is that Brian has a vision behind this charter for your community. He's also helping the Bowden community develop that, and that's part of his network. That's going to be very different from the way that Sonia operates her campus and the network that she develops between Gates and Cameron. What we're going to do is to create that flexibility to allow them to do that for a network in a way that best serves your kids. Share best practices. So this is another unique opportunity I think the staff is really excited about. How do we get to learn from other great campuses across the district in a way that's formal and is organic? Like we as the network, as principals, get the opportunity to create that, not necessarily being told we have to come to a universal event um, and share best practices. The other is to provide campuses with additional resources. So part of the structure is actually to, um, or will allow for additional funding and resources to allow you to implement the things in your charter. So one of the one of the FAQs is, what will change for my students day to day? Not much, hardly anything. But what you should expect are additional opportunities and learning experiences due to the extra resources. I'm going to skip this. This is about the learning opportunities for the principals. I think given the time, I want to make sure that you have time to get to the questions. But the one thing I will highlight is, you know, as Brian has gone through um, his move into um, operating multiple campuses, that's a change in um, the type of professional development that you want. So part of what this network is going to do is, as we give you more flexibility, let's give you learning opportunities on how you execute the budget behind the charter so you know you're allocating resources um, in a way that's going to get your community the things that they need in the charter application. Um, how do you do more effective um, communication so that as you're leading two communities, how do we increase efficiency in communication channels so that we can be more proactive about getting information to you as families um, in a way that makes you feel very comfortable. The other is, I think, just part of the learning process and beginning to build deeper relationships with you and let you understand who I am. I just want to offer more opportunities for you to sit down and get to know me. Um, so here are um, three opportunities. So April 10th, April 12th, April 15th. If you signed up, I'm willing to email these days out. Um, and please feel free. You, not, you could come um, to the Gates Coffee Chat and come see what another campus in the district looks like. Um, sit down and you know just get to ask questions in a, in a much smaller setting. So um, I would invite you to come um, and join one of these additional um, um, library chats, and I will share the information uh, with those that signed up today. All right, so I'd like to open it up for questions. Brian and Steve, I think, are going to join me um, and you know, allow you guys to ask questions if you have. As you have questions, you can just raise your hand and we'll call on you. We're just going to circulate throughout your room. And we're going to repeat your question once you ask it so they can pick it up on your mic. Yes, sir. Just to clarify, is, is this SIC thing? Is it just you? Is it one person? Is it a board? 
What's the structure of it, I guess? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, yeah, so the question is, is, is kind of who is the sick? Is it just you? Um, is it always intended to be you? Um, probably a little bit of kind of like how it started. Um, so sick right now is actually just me and initial set of uh, founding board of directors as we were um, working with Brian and Sonia trying to get this up and running as mission aligned. Um, we have focused very, very intently on making sure that we are mission vision aligned. Uh, this organization is going to stay small because a lot of what it is is empowering uh, your principles. Um, so I don't imagine that this is you will see any more than just me, maybe potentially one other support staff um, supporting the two campuses or the network principles. Doug, how do you understand the Lamar mission vision? So, how do I understand the Lamar mission vision? That's another question. So, part of actually the reason that um, we actually went to the activity at the beginning was indirectly to help me better understand your mission and vision as a community. Um, I've read your charter, I've also, you know, talking to some of you, it's been a long time, I think, since we revisited the charter plan. Um, so I think today, I, this is actually the, one of the first steps in me understanding the mission and vision of you as a community. Um, a lot of it's also just relying on Brian. I trust Brian, and I'm here to empower Brian, and Brian's the one who is the representative of your mission, your vision, um, and so he very much owns that. So the, the question is effectively, when did SIC get introduced into the conversation? Was it always part of the plan or was it introduced at a later point? When we wrote our charter, we knew that we needed funding. Uh, we wrote the TEA grant, got funded at $800,000. At that point in time, there was no plans to uh, partner with a nonprofit um, to explore this. I, I had never heard of it before at that point in time, and I don't think uh, any people here had probably. Um, so uh, it was introduced um, when the RGO, when the R When the, when the RGO work started in 2018, that's when it was first introduced. And it's sort of like a, a, as this, um, well, first it was understanding what this network initiative was and how what the implications were for me, certainly, and then the campuses. And then in working through the associate principals and, and thinking about um, what are role-specific differences that I have to engage in. So that, that was the first bulk of the work, is better understanding the role and then how to support both campuses uh, while visioning out the charter at Bowden, but also um, supporting Lamar through um, a, good, a good implementation of our charter. At the same time, uh, as the RGO partnership was unfolding throughout uh, the fall of this year, the nonprofit idea was was, was introduced. Um, so it was, wasn't really until the fall of, of 2018 that it was even on anyone's radar. Um, and even then, it, it, it was sort of like, like uh, what is this? How does it look like? How does it sound like? And we like, really had to do some work to figure out um, as a new initiative, like how it would play out on, on our campus. Um, so yeah, so it wasn't part of the original charter. Um, uh, it does it does certainly fill some needs to help support us through the next couple of years as we grow together. <laughs> Is it true? So your question is: Is the having a nonprofit partner um, is there a direct line from that to the RGO partnership? And and this is where I may lead on Doug a little bit as well is to say that um, it's not a requirement. Like we we didn't we didn't need to find a nonprofit partner necessarily. Although when you look at the the benefits and drawbacks, um, you know you can then make a decision about whether it makes sense or not. Uh, but the but the expectation was at some point we would identify a nonprofit partner to help support um, our campus work. From, from the TA and um, RGO perspective, was it the expectation that we would, that every RGO partner find a nonprofit partner immediately? Yeah, so there, that was actually somewhat flexible, but I want to differentiate two things. Is 
one of the things that when we empowered principals to like go through this design process and think about how they might manage a network was, do you then look at some of the policy levers to pull additional resources to your campus? And that's actually where the partnership initiative around Cinebill 82, and that is a requirement to have a partner. And so I just want to make sure it is a requirement to have a partner to pull those additional resources, not necessarily for the RGO fellows, um, but one of the things we did ask them to explore is as you develop this network, you need additional resources, you also need additional flexibility. Um, this is a great policy that, that will help you um, do that. So I hope that clarifies or answers your question. I think this is a good time for me to jump in. So uh, my name is Steve Leshlow. I am uh, your elected school board member. I represent uh, Lamar and many of the uh, surrounding adjacent neighborhoods. So uh, I've been on the board for six years now. Um, I uh, was first elected in 2013, and I was really proud that the very first vote that I took on the school board was to create a partnership between uh, this campus, uh, which had a different leader at the time, and Trinity University. Um, Lamar, as all of us know, right, and all of us who, who love this school know, um, it has been a, a hidden gem in this city for many, many years, right? Not just like every public school, um, especially in a big bureaucracy like SAISD, um, it always hasn't been uh, been empowered, and so this jewel maybe got a little dusty. Um, and what the uh, partnership with Trinity was intended to do originally was to clean clean that jewel up, right? To to provide it the extra resources that we know our schools need in order to create uh, take a good school to a great school, right? Uh, Brian was hired shortly after that. And uh, many of you have been involved in, in the upward trajectory of Lamar uh, from that good place it was back in 2013 to the excellent place that it is now, right? Um, so what we all can agree on, I think, is that our public schools across the board, not just Lamar, but everywhere, are underfunded, right? There's a big fight going on at the state of uh, uh, in Austin right now, uh, about school finance, uh, we are effectively asking our, we as, as a state, as a community, are asking our principals and teachers to do, uh, to do amazing work, uh, but at a cut rate price. And uh, part of what we have been advocating for in the state is increasing the funding that's coming to our schools. Now, two years ago, in the last legislative session, there was this great opportunity that was, uh, that was given to school districts, and this is what you may have heard, Senate Bill 1882, right? Now, what, what this legislation provides is uh, if schools or districts partner with nonprofits, with universities, or with charter groups, then the state's gonna give us an extra $1,200 per student per year, uh, specifically to reinvest into the campus, right? Now, this is a whole lot of money, right? We get from the state about $6,500 uh, per year per kid, and so think about an extra $1,200 per kid, right? That's a lot of money. But it requires partnership. Now, one issue that SEISD has had for years and years and years and years is that you have a great principal come in, they have this vision for the school, maybe they create a charter, maybe they don't, but everything that's happening in the school is predicated on the great leader. And our district, uh, historically, has just not been good at keeping our leaders or empowering them. You can imagine in a 7,500 employee organization, that uh, bureaucracy takes hold and it becomes really frustrating. And we have a lot of great leaders historically who've chosen to take uh, jobs at other school districts where uh, maybe those burdens are less uh, are, are less overwhelming. And what happens when that happens is that the vision of the principal, the great things that were happening leave with him or leave with her. This is a, this has happened, a good example is at Hawthorne, uh, which is kind of right down the road, right? 
Uh, back in 2004, Algon partnered with Trinity University. They created this amazing book called, they called Core Knowledge School. It was the best school in SAISD, right? Then what principal left, and then the staff at Trinity changed. And what you had after that was a charter that was a core knowledge charter, but it really existed without being implemented at all. And so the community had gotten together, the community had said, this is what we want, then the leader leaves, and what the community wanted just kind of atrophied, right? It just totally went away. And so one of the really great opportunities that this, these partnerships is a guaranteed fidelity to the charter, to the vision of the community, right? So I was part of this, Brian mentioned a few years ago, I see some faces, right, who were part of this whole charter visioning process. This, this was not a quick snap your fingers and go process, right? This was a, uh, a deep conversation with the community, with stakeholders, with parents, with kids, to figure out exactly what it is that we wanted in our school, right? We then Brian and, and the staff wrote this big document. We got buy-in from our staff. Over 80% of the staff members agreed. Over 90% of the families, the parents agreed that look, this is what we want for our community, right? And for the last two years, Brian, as the leader here, has done a really great job using that, uh, that community feedback, using that charter to grow the school, to improve the school. But there's a huge risk, right? There's a huge risk that if something were to happen, right, that a new leader comes in and they have a different vision for the school. And so we start going a different path. And all of the input and all of the investment that you guys made as the community effectively becomes, uh, becomes uh, rear view mirror material. Partnerships like this, like what we're engaging with, uh, with the collaborative, exist partly to ensure that that doesn't happen, right? The partnership is creating what, what we're calling kind of an advisory group, right? The partnership has an executive director. And the role, partly, of the advisory board and the executive director is to make sure that no matter what, this community's voice, this community's voice that was reflected in the charter, remains implemented. It remains a priority, right? This prevents the, the possibility of someone else, a new leader coming in, who has a different idea about how things are going and just totally ignoring what the community told us is important in the school, is important for Lamar. Because truly, Lamar is a reflection, and the charter is a reflection of you guys, right? It's a reflection of what you wanted in our school. So the partnership is not intended to come in and tell you guys what you should want. You've already told us what you want. And that is a codified document that we're calling a journey, right? The purpose of the partnership is to enhance that journey. It's to enhance the efforts that Brian is doing at this school and Sonia is doing at, uh, at Nates and Camp, right? Um, specifically for Lamar and, and, uh, and Bowden and Cameron and Gates, what we saw as a district, we had two really amazing leaders, right? Uh, Brian, uh, I think we will all agree, is, is exceptional. Sonia, you, you don't know her, uh, but what she has been able to do on the historically uh, ignored and neglected east side with, with our babies over there is truly amazing, right? We have these two amazing leaders who are doing amazing things at their schools, but what they would say if we gave them truth serum is that it's incredibly frustrating to deal with this bureaucracy, right? Like this district that has all of these entrenched uh, systems and structures and requirements, they're having to fight those fights all day, every day to make sure that what Lamar about again is, um, is what our school needs. Like Doug mentioned earlier, 
now with this partnership, he's able to to be that uh, that bulldozer um, who gently uh, interacts with the district, the gentle bulldozer who interacts with the district uh, to to remove that burden from these amazing principals, so the principals can focus truly on being in schools and in classrooms and helping develop these amazing students and this, these amazing schools, right? Um, like Ryan said, we would never, ever, ever have partnered with a group if we did not believe that it was going to be in the best interest of our leaders, in the best interest of our school, or most importantly, in the best interest of our kids, right? This community told us in 2016 what it is committed to, what its dreams are for, the, for this campus and for their kids, and what it wants. Doug is here, and his, uh, this organization, his partner, is here to enhance what you told us, right? With regard to, to this, uh, this idea that uh, we're, you know, uh, flippantly partnering with some startup that's existing for times, right? As Doug did a good job explaining, th this, this idea, right, of the collaborative has existed for well over a year. Doug has been working to form this thing. And the idea that it was that a nonprofit was incorporated two weeks ago does not mean that it was some idea that was thrown together at the last minute that we as a district are irresponsibly partnering, right? There were pre-existing relationships. These ideas have been been germinating for quite a while, right? And it just so happened that during this this process, right, of finding a partner so that we can get the extra money from the state. It took us, Sonia and Brian, a little bit longer because we wanted to be sure, they wanted to be sure, that this was the right partner. Brian used the word alignment, right, a whole lot. Alignment is, is critical. And we would, if, if Brian and Sonia told us last, last week on Monday, we were strong-armed into this, right? we do not believe that, that there's a line here. Then we would have never, as a board and as a board member, we would have never voted for this, right? We would never force something on them or on y'all or on the school or on the kids that wasn't uh, something that they believed deeply, right? So these were the considerations from the 30,000 foot view of the district, right? We thought about and considered, you know, everything that this community had told us about how important the school was. Brian, uh, you know, in his in his blood and his bones, he knows what the priorities of this campus are. And we, what we were able to do is find a partner that mag that is going to be able to magnify the good work that they're doing, right? So I know that this is kind of not an indirect answer maybe to, to, to the gentleman's question, but I really think this is, that it's important for you guys as we're going through this process to, to understand where our mind is, where, where the district's head is, right? And to truly know that our objective with this partnership is to increase the effectiveness of these two amazing partners. That's it, right? We want Brian and Sonia to have every resource available, possibly available to them, to help these students and the students at all three of the schools to do great things, right? That's why we pursue the partnership. Yes, ma'am. Yes, hi, I'm Aviva. I'm on the PTA here. I have a bunch of questions. Um, I want to start by saying that I came here in 2015. Um, I was really happy when I came. I'm still really happy. And just to kind of give some background on the charter process, I was, um, you know, I came in kindergarten, really happy with school. Brian, you can do whatever you want because I'm so happy. And I think a lot of us felt that way, right? I was not, I do not have like a, 
you know, I was also a parent of a kindergartner, so at that time I had a vision for kindergarten. But then as my kids grow up, the educate like my knowledge about what I want kind of changes a little bit. Um, and so that's just I think that perspective is important. Um, so since I've been here, there have been a multiple of uh, reform efforts. Right, we're going from approving a charter, which I was like, go for it, do what you want. After that, there's the, the network principle, which again, I'm like, ooh, that sounds hard on a principle. Like managing two schools, I'm like, oh, whatever, go for it, we want to keep you here. And so, you know, now this past year, we've been um, experiencing what it's like to have a shared principle. And my question is really about, what has been the evaluation of the reforms? Because we have these big reforms, but I don't see, I, I don't know if anybody here has actually read the charter with a lot of detail to really understand what it means or what the charter is. And I don't believe that we've had an opportunity to really evaluate the charter and think about like a formal evaluation, you know, before running to the sort of entire structural change around management. Um, there's a lot of assumptions about um, that this is great and this is working, you know, because we feel good. But in terms of the nuts and bolts, I don't know if we've had an official evaluation of the charter. And so we have a, a management agreement that is seeking to implement the charter that has not been evaluated. And so this is my concern that along the way there have been a lot of reforms that have not been formally evaluated and a lot of assumptions about what parents want, and assuming that because certain parents, about like a handful of parents that are here that voted on the charter, that becomes the mandate for parent approval to then vote on this uh, SB 1882, which I was at the board meeting, and I think there was a question that, that um, this was all done with parent approval. And I'm on the PTA, I was involved, I'm here every day. We did not know anything about this. And so Monday morning, we find out from San Antonio Express News that this is happening. So, so the questions that I have are number one about what's the evaluation process? Because I think that, yes, we all respect Brian, we're really happy that he's our principal, but have we had a chance to evaluate this network model? Um, and what this SBA 1882 is doing is without the evaluation, putting it into the district structure. And now, at this point, it's too late to not approve it because you've approved it. But without, without proper evaluation, right? Your evaluation is Brian's doing a great job, but without hearing from the community. So, my other question about so, number one is what has been the evaluation process of all of the reform, which are major reform? all major reform efforts. What has been the evaluation? Is it just anecdotal based on what you're hearing for some people? And number two, how do you see, like my understanding is that as a public school, you are our elected representative, right? So we are your constituents. So what is the relationship that, and maybe I'm wrong. I'm thinking maybe that's not what a trustee is supposed to do. Maybe a trustee is just supposed to listen to the Principles. I don't know. I don't understand. Can you help me understand what is the relationship between the elected board member and the constituents in terms of mediating the information that is coming through? Because I don't understand that. That seems unclear to me. Because if I had an issue with something, I would think that I would go to a board member. The board member would at least do a job for some effect. Because this is the one decision about um, any decision that's from the board. My assumption is a public decision. But this didn't seem to be a public decision for, in terms of constituents, it seemed to be like sort of a board member decision. So can you help me? So evaluation and then your role as a board member. Those are two questions that I have. All right, uh, thank you. So, uh, two, two very different questions. Uh, so, with regard to evaluation, right? Um, the charter went live in 2017, right? That's a year and a half ago. Um, the charter truly, and, and I, I forget what you said you, that you were there, if you were, you were present. Um, there, there were some people here who were present, and it, it was a, a really in depth effort to figure out what the community. What the parents want, what everyone 
who is involved or invested in Lamar believes this school should be and should look like, right? Um, it's only been a year now. Now, we have uh, a robust kind of team and effort that, that does kind of the data analysis and the analytics. Um, every, you know, every day, every month, we're, we're always, our district is always evaluating from a quantitative perspective how schools are doing. And that's part of the feedback that the principals are always given, right? So there's ongoing evaluation, right, from, from a, a data perspective. But what you know and what I know is that like test scores aren't the only thing that's important um, in, in our schools. So what we also have are, um, are kind of community conversations um, about the impact, right, of the SEL program, the, the social emotional learning, right, which is a big part of the charter that Brian implemented, right? Now, we evaluate those differently, right? There aren't quantitative metrics that we use reliably to figure out whether the SEL pillar of the charter is super effective or not. Um, but we are always evaluating that piece of it as well, right? So the evaluations are ongoing. They are happening all the time. What we also know with any school that is implementing something new, and this charter was something new at the is that it's not all going to happen at once. And the results aren't going to immediately show. And so this is why when we're, uh, when we're creating new charters, there's a three-year runway that we provide them. We provide all new charters to actually like show results. This this is part of why we take the writing, the, the, the papering of the charter so seriously, right? Because this is a three-year commitment that we are at, at minimum, right? That we are making, that the community is making into the processes that, that the community agrees with, right? That's the evaluation piece. So now the, the uh, so, so it's ongoing, I guess, is, is the big thing. And I would welcome a conversation. Um, if, if you think that any of the pillars of this charter are not performing like you would like, I think Brian would welcome that conversation. I know as a district we would welcome that conversation. So, so please, this, this, is, this is a living document, right? As far as me, um, I am your elected representative. You are my constituents. Um, and I have a duty to you guys to do what's in the best interest of every single student in this school district, right? My fiduciaries as a school board member are the kids, right? Which is totally a unique thing. And when you think about elected office, right? Like, Roy Doggett is my congressman, I elect Roy Doggett, like he, I am his fiduciary. But in school districts, it's just a little bit different, right? Because you elect me to govern a school district. The school district's priority is to make sure that every single student becomes a, uh, a valuable member, you know, whatever our mission is, is, right? A valuable member of society, well-educated, like there are a thousand different things that we want our kids to do, right? But I'm also responsible to you to communicate, to reach out, and as part of the charter process, I think those of you who are involved saw that piece of it, right? Um, you know, I, uh, yeah, and, and so, and so the, the day to day communications, right, are with parents, are principal parent responsibilities, right? Like, you come to the school, you ask questions. Um, what I will say to you guys always, and a few of you I see faces in here that, that know this, is if you ever have a policy issue and you come to me, I, I am super responsive and I am committed to being super responsive, right? Uh, that's my role as a school board. Um, and I'm happy to engage with any of you guys um, at any time. So please know me. Chris, I saw that you had, a, you had your hand. So I have a couple points. like the door Brian, right? So the number one is we think Brian's done a great job. We want Brian to stay. Um, and 
part of six years ago when we started on this charter. A couple of things. Um, when we were working on this and working for you, like, there were things like SEL um, that were thrown in at the last minute. Um, they personally, I'm not a huge fan of because I don't think it's implemented correctly uh, here on campus. Not because I want to, but I may not have all uh, uh, things in the district. Which maybe that's helpful. Um, but then, and then also like links, like it ended up being supposed to be across the board. It ended up being I think one or two classes like for one class for grade level. Can we respond as we go? Or? Wait, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I can't hear you. Can you can you get on the mic? Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. I know the mic is open, but it's from the beginning, I guess. I don't know. Did everybody hear everything? What did you not hear? Uh, so we've been here, I was going to say, Morgan, correct me if I'm wrong, because we have been here since like the six years ago when we helped being a huge partner. Oh, I said we love Brian. I said we want Brian here. <laughs> the number one is we want Brian here, we support Brian. That's what we like. But the charter it turned into something that wasn't completely everything that we had talked about six years ago, and it was things that district had made changes to that were kind of like, again, like, well, we trust Brian, that's fine. Um, some of them being the SDL uh, and the dual language not being across the board. Uh, the question I have is, one, with the charter, like you said, we, we didn't get there as quickly, right? Because I was like, sign the paper, let's go and be a charter. And I remember you saying to me, like, not that quick, Chris, it's not going to happen, right? So we halted because not everybody had the information, we hadn't done enough study, didn't get the word out. Why can't that happen here? Why can't we halt this um, and really figure out who Doug is and or Doug's program and what you're going to do when you come in? Um, because there's a lot of talk about how you're going to have everything as far as control over the school, but like in this contract, it's it like it says that that they'll have full authority to change the curriculum or the vision. It says that he has vision to do all the hiring. Like so, it says in the contract that that's not true. So can we alter the contract then to have a little side note that says in this one, no, they don't have that control. And another, I guess, question, Steve, because we work together a lot, um, and I do respect what you do. However, the showing up the, the document, the twelve hundred dollar document, page document, to read that in one weekend, and the whole board to come in and vote on that, I just don't see how that's possible. I don't see how it was able to go through. And I know I trust that you have the good intentions, but I feel like we don't have all the information yet. We have already lost Brian. That wasn't part of the charter that we were going to lose Brian half a week. Like, Brian made this a good school because Brian was here every day and because us as, as teachers and parents were here every day. And then it said, let's have Brian and go put him over another school because they can come too. But Brian didn't build this school. Like, Brian built this with teachers, staff, community, Trinity. Like, and, and they're not going to that. Okay, Brian, can I make one, one just tiny point? Yes. You can. And it's not a question, so you won't have to add it to your list of things to remember. Um, I do feel like I think we could have done better. And I think that needs to be said, Steve. I'm really sorry. Like I just I think that is thing that ties us all together, right? Like there are things that Chris says here, and I think we should have done better, we should have communicated better. I think we can agree to that, right? Like that's sort of the qualify, like everyone's like, yes, okay, let's start there. And say, how do we do that better? And I'm looking at you three guys saying, help us do that better, and we'll help you do that better too, right? Like as a community, we'll do that because I believe that with Brian's leadership and Doug's guidance and with Steve's policy support, we can become an A school. But we're only going to become an A school if we do this together. And it feels, I just want to make sure that that is said today because I'm not hearing that. And I really want to make sure, like, I'm not going to back down from that. I'm not wrong. I'm not going to be made to feel like I'm wrong. Does that make sense? Like, I really want to make sure that we say that. That, that asking you guys to communicate with us is fair and right. And I'm a bush show because I love school. Yeah. I just want to say that. Yeah. Okay, let's, 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 let's have a 
I just want to respond to a couple of the things that were brought up uh, before, and then we'll move on to the next question. Just a, just a couple of kind of clarifying pieces about the, the visioning process for the charter. We were never going to be a, a full dual language school. Our, our numbers don't support that on our Spanish dominant side. The only way for us to go towards a full dual language school would be to draw more Spanish dominant kids into the school, which was never on the table for discussion. And so just to clarify that piece, he that one of the reasons why we went towards a dual language model is because a decision was being made to move our Spanish dominant kids towards a different school. That was not my decision. That was a district level decision that they make for all sorts of different reasons that make sense at a district level, but we didn't want to lose those kids from our school. So we, that was one of the reasons why we fought for dual language for that one class per grade level. It was only going, uh, it was only going to be one class. At, it was never going to be full dual language. We, we, we don't have enough numbers to support that. Um, just, 
It's on our website on the homepage. It's linked on the homepage. You can click on it or we can make copies here if you want a hard copy. The second thing that I want to say is that um, as far as the SEL curriculum, we heard a lot from our community and from our teachers because they are a part of our community and from our partners to, to say it's not just about the academic core. It is about the dispositional, behavioral, um, social, emotional skills that kids need to be successful in the classroom. And the more we get into this, they are one and the same, right? So as we teach about academic skills, we are integrating social emotional skills into good instruction. So we heard a lot of that from you. Um, and not everyone here in the room. And um, so as you think about like that process, we asked a lot of questions to flesh out what you value in our school. But teachers were part of that conversation too. It's not just about families, it's about teachers and our staff. The third thing I'll say, and then I'll get off the mic, is to say that if we ever want to revisit our charter as a community, we can do that. That's not off the table. But we also have to give it time to implement to see if it's working or not. And if it's not working, let's go back to the drawing board to see how we tweak that charter. But secondly, it's, it, it can be something where if it doesn't align with your vision and mission for what a school should be doing, or if we're not living up to what's in that charter, then let's go back and either implement better or revisit the principles of the charter to figure out how it can better align. Um, having said that, that would be a robust, long process, and we still have to give it time to implement. We're only in year two. So I would just say that. There was a question up here first. Can we get this question first, and then we'll go to that? Yeah. So my question was, I appreciate the assurances and the commitment to greater communications. Concretely, what is that going to be like in the near future? So, is it going to be like mail, email list, group chat, forum? The question is about uh, on a concrete level. What are the commitments that we're willing to make as a district to improve communication um, for issues like this? Is that accurate? Yeah. Well, I think I, just for myself on the campus level, you know, we were waiting so long to get a partner to bring in front of families, and we should have clarify the process. Like if, if there's process is one piece, like how how and what are we doing? And then even without a partner, we could have brought that in front of families and had a conversation about what you want to see in that partner. That's on me. That's not on Steve, that's on Doug, that's on me. And in waiting, I wanted to bring information to you that was concrete so you could actually wrestle with um, who the partner is and, and how it feels to you, what are the pros, what are the cons. And in waiting for that, it got too late. And so that's on me. If I could play it back, we would have conversations back in October in November and December through the early spring. So you would have clarification at least on process. You wouldn't know who the partner is, you would know we're actively seeking one, but, you, uh, but at least you'd have some understanding of what the partner is and what they would functionally do on the campus. Um, and without that information, um, we're putting you in a really bad spot. So for me personally, uh, thinking about process orientation, like what is happening and, um, and giving you access to that information in forums like this, but also in writing as well to make sure it gets to everyone, is something that I think we can easily commit to. Uh, and just, you know, I, I think one of the conflicting things um, for me is that I feel like that, um, that we have strong relationships here, we're a strong community, and we value the voices in the room, families, teachers, community, and um, that was not in alignment with this process. Um, and part of that's on me. Uh, so it, it, it feels like a strong sense of conflict for me personally, just because I feel like it's not in alignment with our belief system here. And, and I think that's why it feels, I think, worse than it would have been if you're in a place where it's like um, a leader or it's just not part of our value system. It is part of our, of our value system here to recognize and honor the voices in the room, even if we don't agree. And we're not always gonna agree, right? But um, it is important for us to hear each other out and to see where we stand. And you didn't even have access to that conversation this time. And that's not fair. So, so back to answer this question, though. It, it's on it's you, a, but what are we going to do to well, move forward? Well, just for, as far as campus, it's face-to-face -face conversations and forums like this on the front end. And it's written communication to give access to everyone. Because this has, what, 40 people in the room? And we serve 385 kids here. Um, so, you know, over five, six hundred fan uh, parents. So, like, there's a lot of people who aren't in this room who have feelings about this or who have no clue about it, right? They got a, they got a letter or they heard it on the news. That's not fair to them. So, so back to SIC, just hypothetically, if we and the parents in the school, we all got together and we hypothetically 
said that we wanted to change the charter. Would SIC support that? So yeah, so so we have a process, right? Our, all of our schools, all of our charters, right? They're community driven. They're school driven. There, we have a policy in place. We have a process where if a school community decides that they want to change or they want something different, it absolutely, right? So I don't mean to interrupt you. So that would be through a public group. The community group public decided what we wanted, and then as I see, support us. That's what we wanted to do. It's, so it's, it's more nuanced than that. A vote, a vote is part of the process, right? But we would have to say, of course. Oh, of course. This is the, the community, right? This is so your I story. think that's one of our, our main concerns. We're worried about the autonomy that we as parents are going to have because the way that we went through this, we really haven't had any say in what's happening. So we're just worried about going into the future. Are we going to have a say in what's going on? And the contract's written like that, that he has full authority at the end of the day, like worst case scenario, he has full uh, autonomy to our decisions of like course. So can we, can we can we change? Can we alter the contract a little bit that says actually Brian does? Or am I reading the contract wrong? Like can we I have it, should we go over it? Like you know what I mean? Like that's, I think that's the fear of like uh -huh. You may be the best thing that's ever happened to us, aside from Brian. You might not. You, you, might, you may not. So, how do we protect ourselves? Protect. Yeah. Okay. So, um, ultimately, I'm accountable, right, for everything that happens, right? So, what I would say, the contract is written in in a way. Okay. Let me give it. Let me give an example. The school district could say tomorrow, right? He's gone. All the teachers are gone. We're starting over with everyone, right? You don't have a voice by law, right? Like, you just, we could do things historically, that things have been done. We're like, it doesn't matter what you want, we're going to do it anymore, right? This is how schools operate. Like, this is just the system. Now, we don't do it. Right? We value your input. We value your engagement. The contract is written, right, so that the partner has certain abilities, like certain responsibilities that the school district would, uh, would otherwise have, right? The staff, the principal, that doesn't mean, just because the words are on the paper, that doesn't mean that that's what's actually going to happen. And that's why. But it should. And, and most often the case it does. Can I, can I just clarify something here? So, I never had complete control over staffing in the first place. That was the district. They were the ones who were approving. Like, I would recommend somebody for hire. I would recommend somebody for termination. But I don't actually get to terminate them. That's the district who does that. So, all, all that responsibility that was previously with the district, as far as the, uh, the approval for that process, is just transferring over to this organization. I'm still making all the decisions as far as recommendations go, just like I was before. The process for HR is still the same as before, so when I write somebody up, that's the same process as before. It still goes through the same office over there, as far as approval, to make sure that my language is correct. But the end process of approving that is just through this organization, instead of through our school board. So in that way, like I never had complete control in the first place. I have. I have more control now with this organization than I ever had before, and I I, I can't go back. I can't just I, I can't go back towards a place where um, there are decisions being made um, that are for um, fifty thousand students that very likely don't apply to our students and our staff. Um, it will get in the way of us getting where we need to go. We have to improve instructional programming here, especially for our highest achieving students. We have to improve reading instruction here and getting results from our K through two kids. And with all these structures that are in place, um, they don't always help us do that. So if, like, for me, like, I never had control in the first place, you know, as far as a like, complete control. Um, that's just, that's, that's all I would say, like, it's just transferred. And, and, I, and I understand and I hear you, Brian, and I think we all do. I think we all just want to be sure that the language is in place. 
I don't know, you were listening. I was talking and you cut me off and had a different conversation. That's fine. Can you ask the question? No, it doesn't matter clearly. Or you had your hand up for a while. Yeah, I think now you're easy, but we have a process of Right. So I want to talk about three things the board governance, the charter, and the vetting of Doug's company. Oh, okay. Oh, it is okay. Okay, so <clears throat> you guys are great. I mean, I have to say, this is the most amazing com uh, campus, and it's because of the parents. I mean, this is you know, a testament to all of you that you're out here you know, listening to all this. Um, so the charter. So I read the charter. I've been here three years. Um, I never, I was with Habib. I mean, you know, we, my kid, I adopted three, two kids. I was, you know, this is a great place. My kids like it. They're, you know, they sound like wonderful. I did not read the charter. I have now read the charter. The charter, and I want you to hear this, because the charter is not being, I don't feel like the charter is being implemented correctly. The charter has something called the PDB advisory board. Do, I, do any of you know about the PDB advisory board? Raise your hand. You're on it. She, she was on a couple of years ago. Well, okay, but I didn't get, and I haven't gotten a list. I requested a list. It's called the PDS advisory board. I thought it was PDS. Okay, PDS. So, okay, that was the first thing. So I'm reading this charter, and I'm like, this, this, or it, and it's a, it's a multi-pronged advisory board. It has um, Trinity, it has parents, it had one parent review that is supposed to add additional parents. And it's people, um, you know, and again, Brian, I know that it was the initial charter, but, you know, this, it's a living document. It should have been. So that was one thing. So I don't know that there's no transparency on how the charter is being implemented. So we have no way to know if it's working, right? Transfer to the CLT. No. No. The charter mentions both. And that was the other problem. I, I, I am a very active parent here. I did not know about this really. And this is really, I mean, Brian, we discussed that. But I want you to hear this, because I think it, it goes to larger discussion about a charter. You know, we're just, we're accepting, you know, Brian's a great guy. We love Brian. OK, well, you know, whatever he, whatever it is that comes out of this charter movement, it's great. It's not. You know, because it's not being implemented. I have not seen it. It's supposed to be a quarterly report. I've never seen, has anybody seen a quarterly report from the PDP? Okay, so that's your voice. This is everyone's voice here to be part of that process. The other thing I want to talk about overall is board of governance. So you mentioned he's your, he's your representative, he's not your representative. As Garza is your representative. Right, right. So, I know you like, no, but because I, I live right across, but as Garza is my representative. But that's the problem. Right. Because as we, you know, now you can go to any school, voice. So you were, so it used to be, you are, you live, you know, in the, in the district, and you went to your local school, and so there was accountability. Now, Habiba has been trying to get hold of Garza because he, so he didn't even know what was going on. So I demand, I think we should demand a meeting with all of the affected board members so that they can tell us what went on and what went on with this vote. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about is, and I think. It's the vetting, which is the qualifications of an office. Okay, so this has been going on for months, right? This, they've been talking and figuring out who the best like Lamar. We aware. Right, we are not aware. And so this not profit. So I don't, you know, you gotta take away that. That seems great, but the no. <laughs> the no. Hey, so sorry, I'm really sorry to interrupt. I, I. I'm, I'm, I want you to finish, yeah, I want but to I, like, I have a meeting at work, and okay. I want to answer it, question, any questions that you have. Okay, so I'll just be really quick. Uh, so the nonprofit that he is part of, they they filed with Secretary of State uh, last Thursday, and we're officially a nonprofit with the board on Friday. So my question is to the board. It's not necessarily to Steve. It's just because now you know we have Edgar's up with all these people. You're, 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 your uh, your board members are all over this because we have students that come from all over. So how did they go? You know, of this uh, 
It's full invasion collaborative. Oh, great. Where? Have they, did they have a track record in education? Who are they? But it was an insider deal, and it, I mean, you guys, you know, I mean, That's they're right. Like, yeah. But it's an insider deal behind closed doors that, oh, well, this guy, you know, we're trying to work with that. And we had no idea. So I, that's all I have to do. Was, was the CLD aware of any of this? All of our staff, yeah, all of our staff were aware of it. Isn't that the campus leadership team? We can't do it. We have two parents on the campus leadership team, uh, Monty Rodriguez and then uh, Danny Mendoza's mom, uh, Dora Mendoza. And so I, I should just share a couple things. One is there is a PDS advisory board written into the charter. They report to CLT. CLT makes decisions. So the PDS advisory board just serves in an, in an advisory capacity. They're not, in the, in, in any, uh, they're not making any decisions for the campus. The original reason why they were formed is to create a liaison group between Trinity and the campus to make sure that both that Trinity knew about campus occurrences and that and that the campus staff knew what was happening with Trinity and kind of updates with the program. That was the original reason. And then at, once the charter was established, then we, um, because we had this group and then we also had CLT, CLT was always going to stay the decision-making um, committee. So just a, just a couple things there. You're asking for transparency. I totally agree. Whenever CLT meetings are happening, we need to post those minutes, and we haven't been. Like you should be able to have access to those minutes. Um, one of one of the struggles that we experience is finding families to sit on that CLT board. And some some of you know about that, some of you don't, you know. And that's a problem you are either aware or not aware of the board. But if you're willing to serve on CLT next year and have a seat at the table, we need people to be on that board and to serve. It's a once a month meeting, about an hour and a half. Um, please, like, let me know because I want people to to, to really be in that conversation, so you can have access. I have a question uh, to be on that board. I spoke to you about it at the beginning of this year, so I haven't heard anything back, but I'm still willing to interested in being on that. Well, we already had parents this year, but the previous years it's been a big challenge. And even when people commit to coming, then they then they stop coming. Like they so, and I get it. Like, I'm this is not yours to own. But if you like feel like this passion to be in a decision making capacity, like that's the best place to do it, um, it is within our campus structure. But the PDS advisory board doesn't make any decisions for um, for our, uh, for our um, campus. All they do is they report back to our CLT. Will we remain a neighborhood school, or is this going to be opened up to be a true school? I, I really didn't realize until recently there was such a difference. But we are more of a neighborhood school. And then just an open lottery school. Is that correct? How will that change the department? Uh, it won't. Na neighborhood students will always receive priority. Anyone who lives in this neighborhood can move, or who moves into the neighborhood can show up the day and come to school here. That will not change. That this this is a community school. Now there is a choice component if there are open seats. We do allow students outside of the neighborhood to come here, right? Um, but that will never take away from uh, the zoned students being able to attend. So, like, if our enrollment were just were to start to grow from our neighborhood kids, like as we do projections and we we get people to say yes, I'm going to come back for the following year, we would just reduce the number of spots that can go to choice kids. So, like, it would just be like a we would just use the information we have from this group going to next year to then inform how many spots we have that are open. Yes, ma'am. I just want to know why did we have to make this decision at this school board meeting? Okay. So, so that's that's my question. Why didn't we push this back to the next one? I, I, I should have. Yeah, I, I should have. I should have been yeah. very clear, right? So, the application in order for us to qualify for the funding for next school year, the application had to be submitted to TEA by. April 1st, right? Which means we had to vote on it at the last board meeting in order for the thing to be finalized and executed and the lawyers to do what they do and get it up to TDA, right? So if we would have waited, then what that means is that for next year, we don't get the extra funding, right? And we don't get the, the thought partnership that Doug's organization is going to provide, right? So effectively, we're pressing pause on the progress that the school really can make um, for a year. And for, for us, like the calculation that us as a board uh, thought about was whether that would work. 
you know, what, what the balance is, right? And ultimately, those resources and just the thought partnership that comes with uh, the enhancements that come with the thought partnership was, was absolutely necessary for us in, in our board's opinion. Okay, so follow up on that. How does the funding change and where does it come from? Okay, so it's all state money, right? It's money that comes from the state into the district. I have no idea beyond that. Okay. Right? And then, how does the nonprofit funding, like, how does, where, A, where is your funding coming from? And B, like, are you giving money to the state, or how is that working? How are we getting extra yeah. money just by partnering with you? Yeah, well, so, so the extra money from partnering with him is coming from the state. Yeah. There is a percentage, right, and it's written into the contract. I forget if it's 5% or whatever, whatever it is, that helps to fund the nonprofit, right? So there, there are administrative requirements that the nonprofit is going to have to do, and have to pay their salary. Um, should there be a yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, these are really good questions, and they're you know I think like very almost kind of personal. But I think, sorry. Sorry. No, 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 it's great. Like I think like it's very. But it's better. Better. It's it's hard. Hard. So yeah, and I really want to answer it accurately and genuinely. So um, the additional funding that comes is about twelve hundred dollars. Sorry, I just I want to make sure. That, yeah, 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 I know, I know. So the additional funding that's about twelve hundred. So every partnership has a hundred of that twelve hundred. So a tenth of the funding um, goes to support the nonprofit. Quite frankly, it's probably barely enough for me to get by. Um, but what it does do is actually add more resources. So you benefit from ninety percent of it. We only take ten percent. My experience, you know, part of it is like how is I get it? You know, I, I support these across the state uh, before I moved here. Ten uh, percent is very, very small percentage for a district, and quite frankly, like props to your district staff and your board for making sure that those resources are reinvested in your district and your campus. Um, so there's no scenario in which I am pulling funding from the campus that would be available otherwise. Also in the performance contract, it is very clear that it has to be sustainable of public funds, otherwise that's in the contract. So I just want to make those two things clear just to give you comfort there, um, that there is no scenario in which this is pulling funding from your campus that's, that would otherwise be there. So I hope, I hope that's helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's all compensating that management fee is what is given to you to run however you need to sustain your nonprofit, correct? It's not additional. Yeah, if you're on the numbers, that's really small. No, no, I know. You're not, yes, and it's not, yeah. but like just to make sure that it's not like, oh, your yeah. management fee, but you also get like, oh, no, 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 uh, I really appreciate. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I really appreciate you being here. We are committed. I am committed to answering every question that you have. To having another one of these if, it's if you think it's necessary. To continue to listen. To continue to talk. Right. I want to reinforce to you. My belief that number one, there were flaws in the, system, in, in the process that could have been improved that we're committed to improving, right? And number two, what we have created here is absolutely 100% in the best interest of, the, of your students and the students at the school. Um, uh, so again, my name is Steve. Uh, my phone number, uh, for the record, is 210-289-3303. Slow down, slow down. 210-289-3303. I mean, you, you can ask folks in here that I'm, I'm pretty darn responsive. Um, my email address is steve for education that's F-O-R, at gmail.com. Please feel free to be in touch. I want nothing more than to answer your questions and to help you understand why it is that we believe so strongly that this is going to help this community. Um, I'm not necessarily saying it's the end, this is just the end for, for, for me, I have to run. Uh, but again, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. Question? Question. There is a couple questions, yes sir, and then I'm going to go back to the back of the panel. So kind of moving away from sort of all this um, sort of big injury sort of thing, I'm, I'm, I'm where I come from, I'm most curious about two things. One, 
your everyday or the principles, the network principles, everyday routine. You, you, you preface uh, your comments uh, as, as a, this new arrangement wins you something that ultimately wins us something. It sounded like it wins you time, it obviously wins you resources, but it wins you a certain kind of time. And I'm wondering, what is, how are we supposed to weigh that, right? I mean, from our point of view, you've got a principal who's now working sensitively with two schools as part of a bargain that frees up their time to manage two schools, whereas they were the principal of one school under a very heavy and cumbersome bureaucracy. But in our very amateurish sort of scales, we're trying to understand. We all work. We know when you get an assignment or a job, especially if you're the good guy who's good at his job, you get a lot more work, right? And that's just a truism. So help us navigate. What is the integral difference between you being a networked principal and you no longer having this supposedly, and I really I want to emphasize, we don't know how cumbersome your bureaucracy is, this, how much it slows you down. So can you tell us, specific, is it that you are now, you get to focus exclusively on learning curriculum and uh, evaluation as opposed to what, or how do you frame this for us so, you're asking so that we can get away from this uh, bogeyman of the network principle? frame it for us so that we can see how it actually is a win for us, because frankly, I don't think people are so long. So. Got it. Um, I'll say a couple things. Um, one is that anytime something is new to an organization, it brings about a sense of uh, understanding what it is, understanding the change process, um, grieving the old, um, even if the old uh, was just so-so, you're still grieving that, that old like normal that, that I think maybe a community or me as a principal is experiencing, or if teachers are experiencing that, like you have this connection to what was before. And so I think part of this year, just to be transparent with me, has been like, um, I, I do have less time getting to know um, students in a really deep and meaningful level across the board. Like I knew every kid's name last year, right? Every kid from, you know, one through 370. And that's been really hard, especially over at Bowden. Uh, you know, like there's only so many times you can ask a kid's name. <laughs> and then it looks a little bit disconnected, like you just can't remember things. So that's been hard. It has been hard to feel like, um, you know, uh, that, um, that feeling of depth that you get from being in a place full time. Um, and there are a lot of benefits to this, to this model that, that I'll just talk through. Um, one is that it allows us to get people who we couldn't otherwise get to our campuses. Like Roxana is amazing. She's an associate. She really is amazing. And to, and to walk into a place where there's been like a visioning process established and there's this um, path that's been set, and then to have to jump into a role where you're leading the campus, uh, it's a really tough spot to walk into. And we couldn't have gotten her without this situation in place. We would have had. Um, an assistant principal who's maybe here for a year or two and then they're gonna bounce somewhere else. Because it's either me here full time with an assistant principal or um, we get Roxanne in here and then me here and then next year we'll, because of network money, we'll be able to hire another half time assistant principal for our campus. So like, it allows us to get to, to draw talent that we couldn't otherwise get access to is one, is one thing I would say. Um, the, the second thing is that um, as part of, like you asked about the organization, Part of the network initiative is to think about like what are the barriers that are getting in the way of me doing my job and our school running as well as it can run and getting students what they need. And then what are the structures that can be codified at the district level and through this partnership that will create insulation so we don't have to go back to the way it was four years ago. Because I cannot go back. I will not go back. <laughs> so if it ever goes back, I'm, I'm going to leave. And, and that's not like a threat to anybody, it's just like we can't go back to the way it was, it wasn't working for kids and teachers. So like why, why would we, like I can't support that. Um, there were too many roadblocks at the district level, um, and I'd say that in front of Steve too, that were getting in the way of us doing what we needed to do for our kids. Um, so 
Uh, one thing that's been put in place um, uh, through uh, Mr. Chaudhry's office, like he's done a lot of really good work to clear the way for us, but part of the problem is whenever you're attached to one individual person, that there's not enough systems set up right now yet, because there's a lot of work to do, where if he leaves tomorrow, we're gonna go backwards. And this creates a level of insulation from that where we don't have to go backwards. It is codified through our agreement that those autonomies stay in place, even if Mohammed leaves, even if my boss leaves, even if I leave, those autonomies are still in place, even if Doug leaves. Like, it creates a systems approach towards getting these things in place that we know are good for kids. And in that way, like, are there drawbacks to, um, well, and then, the, and then the, the, the uh, last thing I would say is that it gives us access to Doug, but also Doug knows a lot of people in a lot of schools around the state that I just don't know. Like, I don't know who's working in Dallas doing great things in schools. I'm busy here working all the time to try to help us, right? So Doug is really, really well connected in a way that will give us access to information that we don't otherwise have. And then just the last thing I'll say is that we know that, like, we know what our pieces are that we're really trying to work on. I mentioned earlier, it's it's reading and writing in K through two, and it's pushing our highest achieving kids at our school, right? Sonia does that really, really well. And I see Sonia at meetings, and she's a wonderful leader. She's really well respected, and I haven't ever talked to her in specifics about what are the fine grained things that she's doing to move the needle instructionally. And this will give me an automatic line to her to say, what are you doing, Sonia? Like, what are you doing for a third grade reading that's helping you move the needle? And this sort of partnership facilitates that to occur in a way that when I go to a district meeting and I sit in there with 20 other principals and hear macro level stuff that I have to like make my own sense of and there's no time to workshop any of our plans, like, that's not a bad mouth on the district, that's just big systems. Like, it's hard to customize support for campuses and for leaders. This is going to allow us to customize support for us. So in that way, like, yes, there's pros and cons to every single setup. Like, I wish I was full-time at both places. I, I really do. Like, I, I, because I, like, those are the sort of relationships I want to have with people. Um, and I love working with Roxana, and I would never have had the chance to if this wasn't in place. And I love working with Yvonne, who was a former principal, who's now over at Wilson in the associate principal role. Uh, and she's amazing. And it, it doesn't, like, we're pooling people who are highly talented to campuses through this work in a way that we couldn't otherwise have done. Um, and it, it, I know change is hard, and um, I mean, I like for the first couple months out of the year, like I was grieving, you know, like the this old role, and the people who were facilitating our workshops were like, this is what you're gonna feel, and I'm like, I don't feel it yet, and then the next week I was like, I was feeling it. Like I, like I really feel sad that like that things are changing, and I do think it's better for the campus, and it's better to move the needle instructionally to support our kids if we go this way. Um, and I don't know I felt that way back in October. This is not the normative model that most schools and most districts have to do. Yes. This is not what, and this is tied to our you know, inner city status and the kind of experimental modes that we're caught up in. I, I really question the rate of innovation that's taking place in certain schools in certain parts of the state and district. And this is just a large example of that I, that timeline. Let's see where we are in 2021. I don't know uh, what will happen next in the search for money, in the search for programs. Meanwhile, in, in certain districts, you know, the, the biggest decisions they make are should we use HP pencils or number two? Like these, these are the things that we got by the more you know. But the point is, is that this is an experiment. This is great. I see the benefits of it. But it, it, there's always a jagged edge. Why is it that we were losing a fully dedicated principal? And we're just like, oh, okay, I guess that's how that works. Uh, and, I, and this is not on you. I mean, this is just on the structure. It's nothing to do with sparks or persons. You can say stuff about me. I think there's a lot of nice stuff today. You can say stuff about me. I'm just going to talk to my wife and see what she has to say. Okay, can you mind if I answer? Yeah. I'll, yeah. Is that limited? How long are both of you on board? What does this look like in 10 years? <laughs> so, let me, so let me try to get to all three, and I'll, I'll, I'll start here. And I think I can you know, probably split the time here. But um, one of the things I think you mentioned is really important is like there is a tension here. 
Um, I think like one of the things that I really want to clearly articulate to you is like my belief that the best person to evaluate that tension is Brian. And I think he's under, a, like, I've had a lot of respect for him. He's under a lot of pressure from a lot of different people that are telling him how to spend his time and like where he's having to spend his time. And, like what this is going to do is allow Brian, the person who I believe is the most knowledgeable person on the best places to spend his time, the freedom to do that. And I think that's very right. Um, and that may mean that he's taking input for you. I, I think Brian's one of these people that genuinely takes feedback from the community, has been very thoughtful. And like, I can't imagine a world in which when he has that freedom, he's not gonna take that thing thoughtfully about exactly how he spends it. And that may come to really hard decisions. And then maybe hard decisions that people at the community don't like, or maybe it's people in the district, maybe it's me, but he has that freedom to do that. And I think that's really important. And that's, some, that's a freedom that he now has that he didn't have before. And like, that is why I believe in this. Um, that's also why like, I think like, Oh, we're excited about this. Um, so I, don't know, I wanted to share that. Um, there was something else you said, but I've already forgotten, unfortunately. Um, you mentioned, you, had, you repeat your question, Mr. Right? What does this look like in 10 years? Are you still a partner? What's the limit on your partnership? Yeah. What is our future with you on board? That also another really good question, because it, it actually, I think, links back to a question. Um, Story. She talked about that, like or this evaluation process, right? Like you have to evaluate initiatives before you go to them. This codifies that evaluation period. Like it is written in public for everybody to see in that management agreement that every year we are going to be reviewed against the guardrails. If it is not working, your, your board members are going to come in and put steps in place. Every third year, there's a high stakes review. That's never been in place because, quite frankly, evaluation is hard, and until it's written down and formalized, it never. Sometimes it just, it's, you have so many things going on in the education system. You're educating kids, your principals. Evaluation is sometimes the hardest part. Now it's formalized, and if you don't get up to that evaluation, but it's actually in there, codified. It has to happen. It can't just slide now. Um, so I think that's actually another powerful value out of this. Like you may not, you know, believe in me, you may not believe me just yet, but I do think like that is actually a system that's in place. Um, and I want you to, to trust that and to feel that and know and feel sure that that's there. Just to, to clarify, so every year, because the contract has is a 10 year agreement, is that correct? But in that 10 year agreement, at the end of every year, would be an evaluation? What did you say? So at the end of each year, there's uh, what's called like an informal review of the academic evaluation. Every okay. third year, there's a formal. Um, so at the end of the third year, if we haven't lived up to the academic measures, um, which I think Brian actually most articulately put in that board meeting, like if, if we are not living up to what we promised you and your kids, like take action. And it's not. Yeah, but that, and, it, and it cannot go beyond 10 years if we don't meet the, the promises that we made your kids. Um, we can't even go on past the three years if it doesn't. Like how, what's yeah. the process of getting rid of it? If it doesn't work out, we're not seeing now we're now. Yeah, so at the end of the third year, if we don't meet the performance, so it actually we have to, the performance measure have us going up to like a B plus by the end of the three years. Okay. If, if that does not happen, so 10 points of growth don't happen in the next three years, like the district will put us on probation or we'll focus. I mean, you will be part of that process and it's something that the district is building that muscle memory around. But yeah, that's absolutely in place. Um, it was one other thing. Oh, there's also safety nets. Like if the campus got worse, so we, if we dropped the it automatically, like you go to every grant, you automatically the performance contract, can, they can take action immediately. So there's a safeguard. Um, there's the financial sustainability, so there's a safeguard there. Um, so I think one of the hard parts is like it would be great, I think, like, the next, when you talk about the next piece to engage, like sit down and have meaningful conversations about what these elements are. And if, if you need to tend to a step, like sit and create a safe space to do that, because those are important. And I think talking through them actually gets into the why, and I think the why is critically important. I just, you know, I think we wish that we had time to articulate that why before Monday. Well, uh, just to Morgan's point as well, like you, the, the idea of like where is this going, uh, like long term, uh, you know, there was a moment, uh, like last fall, where I was like, is this early fall, where I was like, is this really something that I want to do? And I had to make a decision about whether I'm on this for the long term or if it's just if it's just a one year thing, and then it's not going to be a good fit, and like, I'm, I'm all in, like, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. Um, and that, that might scare some of y'all off, hopefully not too many, but I, I'm here. And I mean, Doug, like, he, he, did a, he did a good job at TEA, and a really fun job at TEA, at least on paper it looks like. Um, and uh, like, he's putting, <laughs> should, I, should I temper that? <laughs> like, he, he's put himself out there, and I, um, and you know, like the process, hate the process, like, 
there's not a partner I could be more excited about than this organization because it resonates with the idea that we grow the work from here out and it doesn't come from outside here. Like this, this, this school is about, uh, this is a teacher's school. This is a place where a teacher wants to come and teach, hopefully, because you get to do really, really cool, engaging things with kids and your voice matters. Um, and if we had a partner that where our voice didn't matter, that would have been a huge problem for us. So there isn't a better partner from my perspective than them. Uh, you might see that, you might not see that. Um, but, I, so I'm, I'm really excited about it in the end. Um, uh, but, it, but it did take me some time to like, get comfort with it and get excited about it, too. Yes, sir. I was going to make a, a point about some of these things tend to get, go after the negative side of things, or, you know, they be overly skeptical sometimes, but I, I think as parents, we still want you guys to know that we appreciate you behind the scenes looking for the best systems, the best things to, to do, and it would be unrealistic to think, as parents, that every decision made at a public school, that there's going to be some 100% democracy and everybody's going to get a vote, because if that's how it works, nothing would actually be done. So, I, I just want, from your standpoint, that we're being, we're being realistic, but we're just trying to be the transparency side. But we all understand, too, it's not realistic to go, okay, everything Brian Sparks does behind the scenes, I'm going to call every parent in the whole school, and they're going to say yes or no, we'll take a perfect vote, then we'll make our decision, because that wouldn't work, to be honest, that wouldn't work. Yeah, and I, 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 I trust the moves you're making. Well, thank you. Um, honestly, the, the idea of um, like posting CLT minutes, like no one's ever asked for that before. And I should have been posting them all along, but the fact that it matters to you, they'll be posted every time now. <laughs> we'll have a tab on our website, you can go click on it, and they'll be posted in English and Spanish. Like that's a, that's a pretty easy thing to do. Um, and sometimes when you're overwhelmed with a bunch of stuff to do, it doesn't go to the very top of the list because it doesn't directly impact kids. And you're like, I have to prioritize those first. So, but if it's, but you guys matter. I mean, if, if it's important to you, then we'll post them, you know, as one detail. It's important to you by the PDS advisory board, the governance piece, like we need to get clear on that and stick to what we said we would do if we're not doing it. I just also want to say like, wake up call for us as parents to sort of, this, this was a public decision, and so when all public decisions are made at the school board, and so I feel like as far as our PTA is concerned, like I want to take more action in terms of Making use of PTA or somehow be communicating with the community what's happening at a certain level because there's a bigger agenda that you know that's taking place within this district uh, around innovation, which I, I actually question a lot of the innovation stuff. But I know people around the country are starting to, including Ron Emanuel, who uh, used to be. Um, Pedro Martinez's boss, who wrote an op-ed in The Atlantic, where he's like, I did all this reform, now I'm regretting it, right? So we need to kind of be aware about the public, yeah, the, right. the board, I as well. Agree. So that's a way to call for but us with this learning. Thing. Yeah. I think we could use up our time better. I'm in the school teaching my kids emotional learning. I'm teaching rock reading, writing science. So I totally agree with what you're saying. Like, yeah. Just because they institute a new shiny object doesn't mean it's necessarily yeah. Good for my kid, you know. So, yeah, for sure. The other one I think you mentioned is this idea of voices that you guys haven't seen and hear a lot. It's Brian's staff, um, and we kind of mentioned bureaucracy and time. Like, we had kind of this really beautiful conversation yesterday around like, what are some of those areas that you get that back? And like, with this formal process, like, principles like, what if there is a training, whether it be GTE or commercial, like, it doesn't apply to me, and we want to differentiate that. Now have that formal choice. Um, I think like that voice, like I encourage you guys to talk to the staff here and see what they feel about this because they're they're an important voice and you're not gonna maybe get everybody, but I think like you, you deserve the chance to hear what they have to say and I know Brian wants to talk about Yeah, I, I just want to make a comment that that our our school day is longer to make room for the SEL curriculum, so you're not losing any academic core curriculum. Um, our like our day is longer than other schools to make room for it. So like it, the first year we did it, we were sacrificing the academic curriculum to make room for it. We realized that we couldn't do that. So our teachers make more money for working here because of their longer school day, and you're not losing any of the academic core. So if you really don't believe in it, then there's no loss of value. It is my point. And I would just say that our teachers. Well, I, uh, I, I think there's things that 
it's like I'd rather have my kid have more instructive free time outside instead of being in the building for eight hours all day. And I think replacing that 30 minutes of whatever this emotional learning thing is, I think they would get more benefit being on the playground for those 30 minutes than being in the classroom talking about their feelings. Right. So I get what you're saying. You're not losing any of the yeah, side. I'm just saying that just because there's a new thing implemented, you know, that's the latest thing some PhD guy came up with in California, some, doesn't necessarily mean that it's better for my kid. You know, that's the point I'm making. The general point she was making. Right? Just because the new things are coming on, the sound doesn't necessarily mean it's actually doing anything for my kid, or it can't be replaced by something that's just a lot simpler, that's more constructive. You know? Sure. So. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I think piggybacking on what you were, the first thing you were saying before we started talking about ruler and ladder is that um, what we're asking as parents is how can we do better to participate in the process and how can you do better to communicate to us? That's what we're asking. That's why we're all here is how can you do better? Apologize and how can you do better? And we can say we want to be part of the process more. Give us opportunities to be there and give us opportunities to because we are participating, we are here. So, you know, going forward, what's the plan? How, you know, not everything needs a democratic vote from all parents. That, you know, that's obviously, like, there's a lot that goes on day to day, but, but big decisions like this, and this was a big decision, and it happened without parents knowing what was going on. You know, the parents were on day. You know, it's like, that, that feels rushed, and it, it, it's upsetting, I think, to everybody that's here in this room. We can get excited as you are about it now, but we need a minute to process the fact that we weren't really processing the first time. I know. I know. I just had three questions. But they're just like, I think, not, not opinion pieces. Like what can we take them one at a time just so we don't keep yeah. them? Yeah. Okay, so the first. Oh, yeah, I like personally, but I sometimes. Okay. Yes. The other I just want to thank you for inviting me so I can hear everything. Um, you don't know a lot about me. This is my. This is my uh, 19th year in the um, district, so I taught for 10 years at Storm. Um, JT Brackenridge, I was at administration, and then these last few years I've been a principal at Gates for four years. Um, what I like about the, the network in particular is just that um, what you guys have here is what I need to do at my other campus at Gates. So we don't have high um, parent involvement, um, we don't do a lot of events that we should do, because um, when I got Gates we were improvement required as the worst school in the district. And so now we're the um, number one school in the district. We're the only A school in the district. So, um, part of, I don't speak well as Brian. Sometimes nervous. I hate to speak on the microphone. It's just not my cup of tea with parents. But um, I'll talk to them, just not on the microphone. So um, what, what's great about it, the, the partnership is the academics. So my student is curriculum and instruction academics. That's my lane. So when I hear Dad over there, I'm like, we can relate. That's me all day. And so we're looking at like what we can do as far as um, our different things that we have going on in our district to make sure that we have our leaders in places that we can make an impact for all of our kids in SAISD. So I know you're concerned about your kids at Lamar. Um, I always think about the kids like everywhere. I'm now on the east side. I was on the west side. Now I'm on the east side. Um, I'll slow down because I talk super fast. Um, but really, it is, and parts of the network are really just good. That's part about being able to have these relationships. So that we're able to um, make an impact at the campus. So here, I, I love that the parents are here. I would love my parents to give me some pushback. I mean, I like that. Those are my best parents that push me. And um, it's, I'm able to look at like how we set these things up and how um, Brian talks to parents and how he has these open forums so that we can make sure we're doing that at Gates and my other school at Cameron. But um, both of our schools are, well, my schools are academic issues. So now that we've turned one school around, now we're starting to look at how do we develop the whole child because now we have the academics 100% in place. Now we just have to look at other parts. And Cameron, we're just starting all over again and um, trying to work on academics, social, emotional, you name it, we're doing it. But um, it is hard. It's hard work. Um, I do more being at one school because your parents do love you. You're there for four years. That's all they know. But the other part that's great about it is that the, um, building the leadership capacity. So our pool, um, I know you're taking this, but it's very shallow in our district of great leaders. And so what we're trying to do is that we're able to build capacity. So yes, I'm 
really good. I'm, I'm a great leader and I got all this energy and spunk, but I also need other people to have this great energy and this funk so that we can start moving all of our campus and our district so that we would be an A district just based on everything academic, social, and emotional, and everything. So I thank you. Um, thank you for having me here. I got to go to HR right now. <laughs> to do even for yourself, but like the, the faculty. Because I feel like there's a lot of like, here's what we're doing. Does anybody oppose? And faculty's like, no, oh, that's great. You know, like, um, that can't really speak uh, their minds without fear of retaliation. Even just because sometimes it's like, oh, I think you're wonderful, but you don't approve a lot of problems. I can find somebody who does and transfer you over here kind of thing. So is there any way to get that across the board that we talk to uh, staff, faculty and staff, that they can freely speak if they if they agree or what changes they would like to see, including yourself, that can go to some outside person that can give us the results we don't have to worry about seeing. It. That would be one. That's possible. Can I answer that question? Yes. One is that there's an insight survey that the district uh, puts out that asks for the sort of feedback that you're referencing, and I don't see that feedback. It goes to our district. So some of our staff completed that. It was really hard to get them to complete the survey, just to be fully transparent with you. Like it, I sent about four email reminders and a couple face-to-face. -face. Like, we, like we don't get the report if they don't hit, uh, I think, 40% of a return rate in the survey, and we, it was up to the very last day. So, so we can help with that. Experience. So maybe you can help. No with, yeah, then you can help with that. And, and, and also when the the times when um, if I really have things to say and this is like an, an anonymous uh, source to tell it to, like I would return that survey. So I don't know why the return rate was low. Like yeah. I, it was like it was really really hard to get responses to the survey. But you'd be open to that. Yeah, I, yeah. Okay. We used to have something in, uh, just as a footnote, uh, like an organizational health um, survey in Northeast IC that was actually really helpful. We would see the results as administrators, and it would show you where your top third, middle third, and bottom third of your staff answered as far as how they scored. And it was a great feedback point for me to say, like, man, like, they, like, I think that they're here with this response about our culture, and they're scoring down here. Like, there's a disconnect there. Like, I don't really know what's going on here. So you would see the results, but like you would know the signs instead. No, it, yeah, it was anonymous. So it was by groups. So you would get yeah, it, sure. And it could be shared, so we know how our campus feels. Yeah, I mean, I, the only reason why I wouldn't be okay with the survey is if it took a bunch of time and okay. it was given at a time of year that was stressful, and then it sent us over the edge, and we lose our mind. So, like, if it's just like a thoughtful administration and it's the right survey, sure. Okay. Yeah. So my second question is: Is do we still have a partner with Trinity? And if so. Where are we going with like the interns? So like six years ago we had two teachers, or like, you know, the student teaching and the teacher in almost every class. But like we don't have that anymore. Now we've got very limited interns we, as opposed to the Yeah, end. sorry, I didn't interrupt you. Uh, our numbers of interns have actually never um, been over like five. I think five is our max. Okay, so maybe and pa I think Pat's five. gone, so Pat's like the best source for this, but like we've We've always, uh, we've never been over half our teachers having interns on our campus because the program only enrolls 10 to 12 teaching interns per year at the elementary level. We have like 3K, gender first, second. So I, can I just kind of, you just got one. So we, we have three to five teaching interns per year. Um, on our campus, we usually try to cluster them in the same grade level so they have thought partnership on the grade level. We um, are slated to have four to five next year, and um, and then we have three to four undergrad classes where you may have an undergrad student in your child's class a number of times learning how to teach and watching, but also doing small groups and one-on-one -on -one conferencing with kids. So you may be hearing about some of those. I don't remember who are uh, if we ever had a pre-K intern. Uh, I'm sure we did. It's been I'm forgetting things now, but like. Um, so I think the answer to the question, yes, we have a partnership. We are rewriting the agreement right now to up for another five years. It's a formal agreement with the district where we're locked in there. They have no desire to leave. We're a good source of uh, we're close. Again, all the same things apply as far as why we make sense. Um, the other thing is that we get an administrative intern every single year that we didn't used to get as part of the MED program through Trinity. So that's also value add. Um, 
and all that staying. Yeah, all that, all that staying, and and I don't want to speak for Pat. You, you can ask Pat about how she feels about the partnership, and uh, she's the main point person with the university. Um, but we want to get the agreement reauthorized um, with the university um, by the end of this spring because they're going through a new department chair search, and they're going to have someone new in place, and they're going to be supportive of it. There's no reason not to, but we just want to have it already in, in place. And my last question was, there's um, it, it's something in the, the contract that talks about um, your company having like a governing board that oversees to make sure you're doing, I guess, your job and that everything's kind of working out. But I, if I read it correctly, it says that it's appointed and not like an elected. So like, do we have any say of like who's going to be the board that oversees if you're doing your job or not? Like, does that make sense? Yeah, there, there should be. So that's a big that's question. So, like, one, I think there's been probably like, I think I've gotten a lot of questions around like the timing of it and it feeling brand new and like who are the board members. Um, and I think like one of the things that I like wanted to very clearly address is, you know, a lot of the vetting process is around me and my expertise creating systems that empower other people. And the other one is, you know, I, I set up about 20 across the state. Um, and one, I think the biggest mistakes that some of these organizations make is they onboard the board members too quickly. Um, so one of the things that we did was one of the things that I just made sure I was 100% clear with the district and with the two principals was we are going to take our time and we're going to find people that absolutely live and breathe this mission vision and we're not just going to find people to make everybody else happy. We're paying for that to some extent right now, um, but it will pay off later. Uh, ultimately, those people are going to hold me accountable for creating a pathway for them. So they are not to like, they're not making decisions about Lamar, they're not making decisions about Gates, they are saying, Doug, are you actually creating space in which Brian wants to stay and feels like he's affected? Um, part of that, that governing board is going to have a representative um, from Brian and from Sonia. Um, they are kind of our flagship leaders, stories we want to tell. I mean, I think you had a chance to hear Sonia, and like, her story is absolutely amazing. Um, so if those two representatives represent them, them and they can help us amplify their voice, um, that, that decision I have left and really trust Brian with. Um, I think what we talked about today is we are going to email out that board form to everybody today. And if you're interested in being that person, um, you know, email us and, and let us know. Um, I think the one thing I just want to make really clear, it is not about Lamar, it's about evaluating me, creating that space. There is a campus advisory board that is formalized in the contract. That will likely, we're talking about being like consolidating these other two advisory boards into something that we can get a consistent routine and make more effective. Um, and in the contract, it has to meet at certain times. That is something that I think we're thinking about the process of like, how does that get put in place because it is providing formal input about the school and your community. Um, and in large part doing that to Brian because this is this is a really about my ability to give them space to do that. So um, I don't know, I hope that answers your question. But the difference between I think the two boards is really important. So I don't think like you actually want to be on like I don't think I think everybody wants to be on something about their community. You don't want to be about something that's actually just creating space for your community. Um, so I, I hope that's helpful. And just a little bit of worry, like, you know, you want to make sure who's appointed to, like, oversee you. Yeah. You know, like, just that, that transparency. Yeah, like, yeah, like, that, yeah, yeah, like, they're using that communicating. And, like, I guess that's kind of where it's kind of nice when it's, like, it's elected. There's a, like, a PTA, like, it's nominated, and these people are elected, you know, by the community because they feel like they'll be, maybe not, you know, like, I think having to uh, be all in of what's going on, but not all in, like, we're going to agree with him. And I yeah. think that comes from the fear of like the school board that didn't read the document yeah. and all said, yeah, it's I mean, you know, just not seeing that. Yeah, that's good. I think the one thing that's really critical here is like, it now formally gets reviewed. And that's public. There is nobody on this that can ever hide from this. So like, you will see it, it will be, it's in the contract. So like, that is the one that if you, if you agree to do something like this and you agree to own this mission vision and help me create space for strong leaders, like, you're going to be with you. Uh, and that, I think, is sometimes very uh, But it's also something that, like, I, I, I feel very strongly about this because I've seen this across the state, that it's better to go slow to go fast, and this is a critical piece, and part of the reason, like, I absolutely have this as a non-negotiable. Um, but I think, like, reach out to Brian about, like, that representation on that board, and I think we have more information about how to consolidate and create the board that's mentioned in the contract and on the advisory board. Um, and I think just, you know, we are we'll trying to be really clear about that. Um, how do they communicate? Like all the board meetings are, are elevated, uh, we're holding ourselves to the so you will be aware it's going to be sent, that we're required to send that information to the district. You're free to come, we'll host them probably at campuses. Um, so we want to make sure that that piece is so you can actually see that they are uh, both 
posting. One of the things that we're asking board members to commit to is one of our governance is actually going through the state training around what are the student outcomes that the organization is trying to hit and focusing every meeting on the progress of kids. Um, and I think that's really important. Like, that's what governing boards should do. Um, and so, like, you'll see that in the form. It is a non negotiable, and quite frankly, a best practice that I think we need to get in the habit of doing. Okay. Yes, sir. So, I have some concerns about the modern um, way the bot is becoming, or now becoming a uh, charter school. How would that affect whether or not? Um, all teachers in the PAs are hired or certified, and I'm also concerned about student um, to teacher ratio, uh, pay, benefits, and reimbursement for the body bought. Because I'm a former TA, I've had an outright bad experience with charges. We follow all the district protocols. It's the same process, we're on the same pay scale as the district. We're, um, all the financial services will go through our district. It's the same structure as before. Um, all the teachers have to be certified. All the a, uh, all the IAs have to follow the same protocol. It's like uh, either an associate's degree or you pass a test or uh, the compilation of college hours, which would um, certify you to be an IA. It's all the exact same as other district schools, so there's no difference there. This is not independently operated outside the district school where we're doing all that stuff on our own. It's still embedded, um, all the HR, um, services as far as like risk management and your insurance, it's, that's all through the district. Yeah. We're happy to stay and talk more informally. I, there's one more question I think from Morgan for the whole group. I want to take a minute and thank Charlotte and Lucas for being here with Natalie today because she is able to document all this stuff and share it with people who are unable to attend. I have her contact information if you want to reach out to her. She's available on the Thank you. Thank you. And this uh, recording will be posted on the website uh, yeah, soon. Soon, and and soon. we'll also um, a, get a Spanish translation up there as quickly as possible. We're going to stay and hang out if you guys want to talk more informally.